So these three gentlemen, and it's a perfect segue from watching the clip about Bruce Lee, who struggled so hard. I mean, really, when you think about what he dreamed and what he did, it's quite incredible. I think you all probably feel like you stand on the shoulders of him. And how far... I feel like I'm standing come. on the shoulders of these guys. I don't even know that why too. I'm on the Let's see how that works. You. Can we see this physical standing? It's like maybe you can create a little pyramid here and... Yeah, no, okay, never mind. That's Stage a little too acrobatic. Yes. To okay, afterwards, we're going to do a little acrobatics and we're going to watch you stand on their shoulders now. But um, Bruce and then so many others and now you guys, if you think about the roles that you've all been in, let's just start. You look like you're ready to talk. You've got the f mic really oh, close. Oh, I'm so just I, really I'm tired. <laughs> I was up with these guys till really late last night, so oh, great, I'm old and thanks. Tired. You kept them up and now they're too tired to even speak. <laughs> Talk about some of the roles. I mean, it's amazing what has happened really just in the last several years. Talk about the early roles. I want to know what you dreamed about, you know, playing when you were younger, thinking, oh, if only I could, if only I could, and now, now, you know, what, where we have to go, what new frontiers there are. But let's hear about the journey of your different roles and how I would presume your horizons opened up over the years about what was possible. I'm going to say you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, you know who this person is, right? Uh, <laughs> You've yeah. seen him a few times before. Um, I've been around. I'm an old timer. Uh, I uh, Actually, one thing I can uh, talk about that speaks to uh, progress uh, you know, very directly is that one of my goals always as an actor was to be in a film at Sundance. That was when I started acting. 20 something years ago. I said, you know, I said, that's really something I'd like to do. I'd done a lot of TV, um, uh, you know, some things that were of greater artistic merit than others. Uh, but, you know, one of my goals was always to be at Sundance. And the fact that I'm sitting here today with, the, my, I guess, my first film in dramatic competition speaks to progress. Uh, and and the, yes, thank you. And the fact that I'm here with so many other Asian Americans, the fact that this room is overflowing right now, yeah. says yeah. so much. Thanks to you. If you would have tried to do this panel, you know, 10 years ago, Janet, I guarantee you this would not have been the turnout. I guarantee you we would not have films and producers here, esteemed producers that we were talking to earlier, uh, where the leads like Benedict are, are on the poster. And, you know, Edson and and uh, you know, Bao and, and, and so many other Asian filmmakers that are here are, are not just here to be tokens, but they're actually, their presence is being felt in a significant way. That is serious progress. But you didn't answer my question. <laughs> What's the question? About your roles, the roles. What, what did you dream of playing in, when you were younger and then how did that evolve over time? Well, I have yet to play the role that I would really like to play. In, tw in 20 years I've been doing this and I've never played a romantic lead. And, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's true. Sorry, Daniel, you're just okay. not good looking What's enough. the lead? <laughs> okay, he's obviously looking for some work right now. Who's got the right script? It's all right. But uh, I have to say, okay, you weren't the lead, but your role in Always Be My Maybe is so memorable. You were so that person that we all know. So it wasn't the lead, but yeah, okay. Well, the, the next time you'll play the lead in, in a role. But enough about me, about these guys. Uh, we want, I want to hear from okay, these let's, guys. Okay, let's hear from Benedict. Um, you have been around too, wow. I've been around the block, yeah, about uh, 20 You just arrived from London, by the way, yes, didn't you? Yes, yes I did, yeah. And you still have your British accent, of course. Yeah, I still got my British accent intact. Yeah. You haven't lost it in a day? No, no, I didn't lose it in flight. I did lose it one time in, uh, in Cartagena, but that's another story. Um, uh, yeah, I've been around for about 28 years, and um, I guess um, thinking about uh, roles that you, you, you want to play when you're younger, it, I, I, it was... It was it was very difficult uh, it uh, getting into the business and and how quickly uh, when you joined the uh, the business how you, know, how you were just hemmed into a you know into a box and you know the first role I played was uh, he didn't even have a name he was just called Chinese man you know <laughs> and, uh, so I, I realized I had a a long way to go you know and uh, you know. And, uh, At least you weren't Chinese woman. Yeah, you know. hey. 
you, you know, one minute you're the waiter, and then you're making, you think you're making progress by being the manager, you see. So, um, um, so um, I, you know, but then I was just sort of, you know, uh, obviously garnering the, the, the experience of obviously what we needed. And, and then you, you just felt that you were just kind of going through this, you just saw this pattern happening. And then the numbness started kicking in. And then uh, that's when you really needed to sort of fight back. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, but back on my, my, sort of my dreams were really just to, to, to play on stage at the, the Royal Exchange in Manchester. And uh, I don't know, yeah, they, they, it, it still eludes me, but I mean, uh, I've, um, yeah, I've been... Um, You're you know, young and good looking, you can, you can do it. Bless you, thank you. <laughs> Um, what were some of the major breakout roles for you where you thought, oh, this is something where I can actually be a three-dimensional person? Um, I, you know, I just wanted to follow the good story, you know? I mean, uh, the, the, there was always one... Uh, you were always faced with a fork road and, and at times of uh, which decision to make and it was like, a, like a, you know, playing a radiographer for 10 grand or... An amazing part on stage for four grand, and you know, you sometimes you're thinking, well, what, what, what do you need, and what could pay the bills, and but what yet yeah, also could nourish your artistic soul, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I took the play, and then that kind of, you know, at that time I was working in a, a cooperative where actors were representing each other, and uh, you know, through that play, uh, you know. Yeah, you garnered whatever um, a number of reviews, and uh, Sir Ian McKellen came to see it, and he was from Bolton, you know, which is close by to where I'm from, in, in Salford, and you know, I was looking for an agent at the time, and he recommended, you know, if my name means anything, say I recommended, you know, that they they does see his you. name mean anything, Ian McKellen? Does uh, that mean? Yeah, yeah, in some places, yeah, you get a number of discounts as well. So, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was significant in the sense that it moved me into getting a, a London agent, you know, and then bit by bit was, you know, it moved through. But one, one of the memorable uh, roles I played, of course, was uh, uh, Kublai Khan in, in Marco Polo. Marco Polo. Yeah. And very memorable in that. And, and I, I, I think especially with that, I mean, for me, uh, you know, obviously from playing things... To the waiter and the, and the, the, the kind of you know the, the sort of there was a year where I was playing six parts were just all gangsters. It's ridiculous, you know. I, I, honestly, I literally had to turn the seventh one down and said I'm all gangstered out, you know. And it's like <laughs> that was the year of the gangster, you know. But um, yeah, to, but to play someone like Kublai Khan, who was you know obviously a, a ruler, of the, a, a fifth of the a landmass of the world, but yet also was you know, a father, a husband, you know, continuing legacy, you know, this idea of, you know, trying to the support, defend his family, and uh, all, of, all of those are kind of uh, just rich uh, in, in what, what any of us as actors um, yearn to play. And then you've gone on to do some very large movies. What's that like for you? Um... Uh, what the the, the event? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty pretty big. Uh, yeah, I mean, hey, I mean, I, I guess uh, when you're talking about when I was younger, I kind of wanted to be Spider-Man at the time, you know. But uh, so, and I always collected um, Marvel comics, and um, it was just a real dream come true, actually, and kind of sort of surreal, obviously, to play uh, the part of Wong and, uh, you know, just it was a very easy audition process of just getting your ID out and uh, showing them my identification. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, it wasn't. There was many hoops of fire. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Chris, you are associated with a film that will probably go down in history as a, a game changer. I'm pretty sure that's a, a, that you know symbolizes a turning point. Yeah, Charlie's Angels yeah. <laughs> being the biggest flop of 2019. Oh, um, oh yes. 
Why am I on this panel? Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, let's talk about the journey. Man, I, when you guys are talking, I think about how it must have been when you guys were, were starting out and trying to, you're trying to make your first moves and trying to make your entry into this industry, which is already an impossible task. It's one of the hardest things to do. And then now you're compounded by the fact that uh, there's just no roles. Like before, when Val was on stage, and we saw that little clip of the Bruce Lee thing, and, and it said, you know, he, he wanted to, he didn't want to play any Asian roles that were de demeaning to, to Asian culture or whatever. Well, you're not going to play anything then, right? And that, that, I guess that was his struggle, and that's always been the hardest part. And I think um, coming from, I mean, I'm from Australia, if you can't tell from the accent. And um, I think Australia was, the industry there is uh, even further, it has, it has it even further way to go, uh, I think, at least when I left. So I, I moved away in 2013 uh, because there just wasn't the work. Uh, and the industry's smaller, so just by the numbers, you're, you're going to get less, um, uh, less chances and opportunities. But I just didn't find that it was uh, fulfilling. Like, you know, all these roles that we, we want to see just weren't happening. And then uh, well, after I moved here, I got stuck in this weird spot because, uh, well, now China's a big industry and everybody's trying to crack this code. How do we make a film that sells in the States but also people in, the, in China want to watch it? And, uh, and then suddenly there's these opportunities for younger Asian um, people to be in these movies. I'm like, oh, great. I might be able to do this stuff. But then they, then they were casting people from China. So now there's this gap of, well, I'm too westernized as an Asian to be in the China targeted movies, but then I'm not white enough to be in like the mainstream. So where, so there was this gap, uh, and it was pretty tough for a while. Uh, yeah, I wasn't having the greatest time in LA, uh, and then Crazy Rich Asians happened, and that kind of changed everything. So uh, I, I feel very honored to be a part of that, and uh, it's it's yeah, it's it's really changed stuff. And I think the the big difference was because previously I felt like if you were going to make a movie and you uh, and, and it was a diverse movie and, and you casted uh, well and you represented different minority groups it was almost an altruistic move it wasn't like you it was like oh, I'm really doing something special here you know but now after Crazy Rich Asians after Black Panther and we had this great year where these where these diverse films were pulling in money and we're making box office, well now you can't really argue with that anymore and you get these execs going, well, <coughs> diversity sells, so why not? So now it's, I think we're all seeing the benefits. I'm, I'm, I feel very, very blessed to be on that journey at this time and thank you guys for your contributions earlier. It, like, we wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here if you guys didn't do what you're doing, so thank you. I always thought, yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I think just to add, um, I mean, uh, definitely from my experience when I was uh, watching Crazy Rich Asians, uh, you know, just such, it just reverberated uh, d d to all of us that it was possible and there were just so many Asians on the screen, you know what I mean? It wasn't like just one and then one dies, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, it's like, oh, they're all there and they're all still alive. It's like, fuck, it's like... It's just like, where do we go from here? It's like, ugh. So, you know, it's, um, and yeah, that, the, the, the springboard of that what, that, what that is happening and how that is bouncing off each other, or, or, of all of us, is, you know, is, is, is beautiful to see, yeah. And the fact that every role was so distinctive, because I, I imagine early in the days uh, when you were starting out, there were roles that, you know, you needed to pay bills, right? But you weren't necessarily that proud of it to, to do that. So now going forward, does it seem like you can be very selective in your roles, do things that also bring in some of the bread and butter, but you, you know, just as importantly, really, really help advance the cause? And can we just keep going? Like, can you refuse yucky roles from here on in? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's not a, you know, you don't want to roll a coaster from where, I mean, uh, you know, with, um, it was interesting with um, watching Bao and, and you know, me um, going through the sort of creative process as an actor, you know, I uh, I, I bought, uh, the, uh, I don't know if anyone knows, like the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, 
and it's an amazing book and it's an amazing book to to any of us as artists you know and and uh, in a way sort of Bruce Lee was always in my corner as well you know and he speaks of about uh, you know there are no limits you know there are only plateaus and th and th and that is it and that's how we see our our careers as artists and our and our our personal journey as as artists and um, you know and and how he says uh, you you are not you are not you know don't stay there where it is the plateau just keep going on you know and that and, and that's our mantra all right you keep improving your craft right Always. as you yeah. as you take on many different kinds of roles I think that's really an important point you know we can talk about the number of opportunities that we get now as as uh, Asian Americans but being an actor period is hard and you know there regardless of what your race or your gender or sexual orientation is you've got to be good at what you do right and so it's not about charitable giving uh, to give you know uh, to make your roles diverse you've got to do the work that you need to do as an actor first and you can't expect uh, people to be giving you roles if you're not ready for them. I think that's something that often gets lost in conversations about diversity. Um, but I will say that the people who, if you're a young actor or someone who's just starting out, it's okay for you to take those roles. If you don't find anything stereotypical or offensive about them, you know, that would be a personal judgment on my part. But you know, everyone needs reps. You don't get good at something without practice. And you need on-camera experience, you need stage experience, you need every opportunity that you can get. So it's hard, you know, even when we look back at some stereotypical roles from the past, it's hard to begrudge those actors because they were trying to make a name for themselves when there were no roles. They were trying to pay their rents. They had kids, they had mortgages too. So, you know, I think it's really just important to, to recognize um, the choices that we all have to make as people and human beings, not just as a member of a certain race. Absolutely. So we know Daniel wants to be a romantic lead. I don't know if there's others. And Maybe we someday. absolutely think he deserves to. Um, Benedict and Chris, do you have dream roles? I want to play the title character of the Matt Damon biography. <laughs> <laughs> to make some dreams come true tonight. Come on. No, I, I always uh, wanted to be James Bond. I thought that'd be so fun. As a kid, I just loved, I loved James Bond. I used to wear a suit around as a little, like, five-year-old kid. Um, yeah. Um, I do, um, uh, no, I'm quite content, actually. Yeah. Uh, Life is good. Yeah. That's saying a lot. Um, you know, I just want to say, though, I mean... You know, with Daniel here, and uh, what is in incredible, obviously, we did know about Daniel's story and, you know, his bounce back and how incredible that, uh, you know, he became a producer and employed so many uh, uh, people of, uh, of color in, in The Good Doctor. It's just such a, you know, just an incredible feat of what, uh, what he's done, you know. So, I'm going to that. Totally. Uh, I think it's a good crowd to mention also your contribution when you spoke out about Hawaii Five O. Do you want to say anything about that? Or are Isn't that old news by now? I don't think it's old news. I don't know if everyone here knows, but it was, you know, it's, it's, it takes certain visible steps sometimes to get to, for change to happen, and I think that was, a, that was a big step. I think that was a big deal. I'll say this. That's the reason I spoke out, because so many people leave TV shows for a number of reasons. Uh, and you know, sometimes it has nothing to do with the artistic uh, you know, life of the show or the, li the role. Um, and, and so often, it just gets paved over with a PR, blanket PR statement saying, we're all going our separate ways, everyone's super happy, we love each other, blah, blah, blah. But you know, when that was happening with my show, I knew that wasn't the case. And, um, there was a point at which the CBS PR department sent me over a draft release, including quotes from me. And, and I just said to myself, there's just no way that I can do this. Because my departure from the show is about, uh, you know, is, is about myself. 
But if I'm silent about the circumstances, then it affects every other single person in this industry who's in the same position and everyone else who's starting out in the industry who will face the same thing. I am doing them a, an injustice by, saying, by staying silent. And so that was the reason I spoke out about it. And I tried, I tried my best to speak to it in my truth. Uh, I tried my best to be gracious because I was thankful for the opportunity. Uh, being on Hawaii Five-0 allowed me to become a producer. It allowed me to direct. And it also you know, gave me 100 episodes of television and I could raise my kids. So there were a lot of really good things about Hawaii Five-0. Uh, but when it was time for me to leave, I knew I needed to say why. I knew I needed to address it because if I'm gonna be one small step in a movement, I can't be silent. And I think we do have to recognize we're still living in an imperfect world. And so we do, it, it may not be the main driving force, but we all are role models or representatives of a community. And if we are going to help uplift our entire community, we do have to speak out sometimes. And that, you know, we choose our battles, but uh, met many battles have been fought and won in recent years. And that's what's so encouraging. And the more of us that that collaborate and support one another, the greater our force out in the world will be. Um, I get to collaborate with Janet Yang, by the way. <laughs> yes. Project. And speaking, wait, hold on one second. Speaking of, you know, one of the OGs, this woman here, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. She was doing this when no one else, almost no one else in this room was doing it, and she was doing it really well. Now she sits here and gives a spotlight to other people, but she deserves a lot of thanks. Thank you. I'm just so thrilled. So we're going to take a few questions from these lovely gentlemen up here. Yes. Oh, I'm not a gentleman, but... Oh, no, no, Hello. For the gentleman. You don't have to be a gentleman. Okay. To, to <laughs> no. But, um, so my question has more to do with identity, because I think as an Asian American, uh, you know, Chris, you talked a little bit about this, but kind of the struggle between the past, which is my parents are immigrants, so I kind of have this connection to China, which is where they're from, and then also this connection to America and kind of finding a place in between. I think a lot of the films, um, the bigger films last year kind of spoke to that, like Crazy Rich Asians and also The Farewell, which is a great film. We should watch it. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that, um, that, that struggle between finding your identity in this world that is ever changing? Well, I, I think I think Daniel's the only one that's actually Asian American on this panel. But um, <laughs> that's a very uh, faulty term, by the way, Asian American. I mean, Asian anything, anyone of Asian descent, I think, is under this big umbrella. So we have Aussies and Brits, and we we love you all. Yeah, I, I kind of felt um, growing up. I noticed that uh, amongst my friends, I only main, I mainly hung out with Asian people because I felt. I, I felt like identified, I felt safer, I felt um, more comfortable and so but I, I noticed that they went one or two ways, they kind of either embraced the culture or they just rejected it completely uh, and, and there didn't seem to be an in-between and I think a lot of that was because we didn't see how it was supposed to be done, like we didn't have that representation on screen in popular culture, you never got to see the Asian guy um, get the girl and that so you didn't really have much to base it off, right? Uh, and so I think th th there, was a, there was a question in the previous panel that I was thinking about too. It was something about how do you, uh, what, what's the importance of, well, how do you keep yourself motivated, right, um, to push your culture forward, even though sometimes it, uh, it might feel like you're not doing anything or it might feel insignificant. I think that's the importance of uh, diversity and representation right there in that question because the disparity between what is represented and, and real life is really what takes away your power and what crushes your culture. Uh, and so it's in, that's why it's important for us to really keep doing what we're doing. And if you have that passion to do it, nothing can really take that away from you. I think that's, uh, that is the problem right there, um, what I was thinking of. I completely forgot what you were talking about. We did have a big <laughs> night last night, so. Um. But yeah, identity is important. Something about Asian, the image of the Asian male, you know, I think by now we've all heard that technically speaking, 
Asian men are at the bottom rung of the social ladder, but I feel that this is changing, like, whether it be because of the <coughs> works of these three gentlemen and many others, K-pop or whatever. Am I imagining things? To me, like Asian men are so sexy. I'm sorry. So I, you know, but this is, maybe just me. Um, no, it, it is in, in the public eye. I think kids in high school, college, no longer, when I, grow in, when I grew up, Asian men were nerds, and that was it. I think, am I wrong in thinking that's changed? I think it's changed. In my world, it's changed radically. And, and because of so much of what's on the screen. I guess the point is some Asian men are nerds, and that's okay. And that's all some they Asian men are not, you know? It's not about being one thing. You know, it's about seeing us uh, in, the, in the full spectrum of humanity. Uh, and that goes for men and women because Asian women have had their share of being stereotyped as well. So, so that's why it's important to tell very personal films like the, the story that Edson is telling and, you know, and, and the story that so many Sundance filmmakers tell because they are personal, they are of their experience. And if we can get as many of those different experiences out there, then we define who we are in a completely different way. I, I just want to add that um, I, if we did get any criticism on the movie Joy Luck Club, it was because of the representation of Asian men. And I thought, Russell Wong digging his hand into the watermelon, throwing a woman up against, I don't know. I just, I thought that did a lot for Asian men, but perhaps there was others. And we've come many miles since then. <laughs> Okay, any... And sales of watermelons rocketed, yeah. <laughs> yes, Josh. Hey, uh, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done, for being here today. Um, but for what's next, you know, the past couple of years have been pretty incredible as far as uh, diversity and representation in film and media in general, but what would you guys like to see happen in the next three years that hasn't happened yet? I would like to see Chris Pang play James Bond. Me too. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. I would, I would also like Let's to see that. Let's make it happen. Or we, we make our own James Bond. There you go. Yeah. Or we make a rom-com where Daniel Day Kim is the lead. Hey. And he gets his own spin-off movie series yes. as a superhero. And as it is, I think Edson described your role, Benedict, as Obi-Wan Kenobi. So, in uh, nine days, so you will be Obi-Wan Kenobi. Right, lovely. The honest answer to your question is that I really, uh, I honestly, and I don't mean this facetiously, I hope for a day where we don't have to have panels like this. I hope for a day that, that, that it's such an assumed part of our culture to have diversity in, in all of its aspects that we don't have to meet to talk about the progress that we've made or not made. You know, it's, uh, it's just an understood part of our, our society. Just on that note, have you found that you're often cast in roles that are, aren't written as Asian? Because I think that's uh, Just before we get step. to that, I think, I think the road to that, what you're talking about, is that we, now we have an opportunity to create content. Now to people are listening and we have a platform. Uh, where we didn't previously, and it's giving a lot of opportunity to, peop to people of, uh, of minority groups uh, and different ethnic backgrounds to tell their stories. Uh, and I think a lot, of, a lot more development has to happen behind the camera for us to be able to tell the stories that we want to see. And then in turn, as actors, we can now have the opportunity to play characters that are fleshed out, that are real, that, that matter to us. And so I think if you've got stories to tell, tell them. I think that this is a great time. We need more content, so do your thing. I have a dream, which is to see an Asian male actor win the Academy Award. How's that? There have been very, very, very few act Asian actors nominated. This year, we're, we're looking at a number of nominations for Parasite, of course, for, for big categories, best picture, best director, best writing, best you know, production design, editing, et cetera. And it was great that they got the SAG award for the cast, but still it's hard to find individual Asian actors that are getting the spotlight that you know we'd all like to see. Aquafina. Aquafina run Golden Globes. Love, Nora. We need more of that, yeah? Uh, Alice. Um, my question is for um, uh, Daniel. 
um, really, I, I love uh, Good Doctors, and, and you brought that from uh, a Korean a TV show. So the question I have for all of you, actually not just Daniel, you're from Australia, UK, and, and American, is the, do you guys see a future in cross-border collaboration? Janet mentioned Parasite, and uh, uh, Departed became best picture because of Infernal Affair, a Hong Kong film. So the question coming from Hong Kong, I'm really curious from all three of you, and including Janet, this cross-border collaboration in terms of productions. How do you guys view it? Oh, really, man. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, I think all of us can see how, how much the world is getting smaller when it comes to entertainment. The fact that we can talk about Bong Joon-ho and people in the Midwest know who he is and that Parasite is in a daily conversation about best picture. It, you know, some, some Korean filmmaker called, I think it was Bong Joon-ho, called the Oscars a very local film award, right? <laughs> and, and I think that's exactly right. You know, when you presume that uh, films made in America are in, in, in the English language are, uh, are the best in the world, uh, is it's, 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 kind of a, it's kind of a small town assumption, you know? Uh, at just the way we talk about history. When we think of history in America, we think about European history. And then if you have a class in uh, Asian history, it's called East Asian history or something like that. So the assumptions are changing. Uh, and we're all watching content from all over the world. And, play, and streamers like Netflix and Amazon are allowing that to happen more regularly. So um, I think the average you know, 10-year-old or 15-year-old is going to be consuming content from everywhere in all different forms and all different uh, methods. You know, my son has no qualms about watching movies on a screen this big in front of his face. And, you know, he'll watch things from anywhere and everywhere. So that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> I, I think uh, I'll speak a little bit about China. It's not been a great year or two for China and collaboration. I think many of us for a number of years felt more hopeful. It's going to go through waves, but the point is that there is a lot of talent all over the world. It is getting more recognized than ever. The boundaries are crumbling. And, and you know, in, in large part due to social media, I believe, and also because of the streamers, the world is flattened. So we can discover Filipino voices or Indonesian or wherever, and they don't have to ha themselves have large markets. So a pair of eyeballs anywhere in the world makes a difference, and that is a, a really big step forward. And as far as actors, I'll just say, just look at this panel. Chris is from Australia. This man is from England, you know, and it just speaks to how far the reach is now of, for casting. Uh, there are stars in America now. So, you know, it speaks to how global it's all become. Okay, one more question, if there is. Okay. Um, so my question has to do with, with perception of how men are, how Asian men perceive, because Janet, you just made a comment where you said, like, growing up, and especially in the 80s and 90s, like for you and for a lot of American. Thank you for thinking I grew up in the 80s or 90s. Okay. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, and for those who grew up in the 80s and 90s, like, for, the, for them, from the American perspective, Asian men were perceived as, like, docile or, you know, they were the nurse. And for the women, and you had, like, the fetishization of Asian fem female characters. But for me, I never had that because, like I was just telling you, I'm actually from Barbados. And, grew, and growing up, I watched the Shaw Brother films. I watched Japanese action films. I watched South Korean action films. I watched, you know, like, and like that was never my perception of Asian men, right? So like when I moved to North America, especially to Canada, and then I realized there's this whole perception, like, I was like, that makes no sense because that's not who I grew up seeing. I grew up seeing them being nerds, but I also grew up seeing them being ass kickers. I grew up seeing Jackie Chan. I grew up seeing Bruce Lee. I grew up seeing like characters like Silver Fox in like those old school action movies. And like, I wonder if it's the fact that because America is so centered in media, that that's where the perception is and it has spread throughout, I would say like the majority of the world. Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, 
I think I think uh, I think you're right because uh, it a lot of it has to do with what we're talking about with the globalization and the speed of internet now is so like you know I remember you remember DVDs and VHS tapes and stuff like where where are they now you don't need them anymore you just stream everything right and so uh, you can access content from all over the world so easily uh, and that's I think that's changing a lot so we were talking about uh, the cross content between Asia and that, and I don't, I don't think it's, it's, lo it's so much about, you know, forcing co-productions and trying to find projects that work in different territories. We can now just make what we make, and if it happens to work as a co-production, yeah, let's do that. You're no longer trying to force it because you don't have to. Like I, th I think that we're now, um, the con the content is is accessible in the way that your experience can be had by many more people and, and I think the goal is that that everyone can appreciate uh, uh, all different content all the time. I think I think it's getting there, right? Okay, well I think we'll end on that note and this has been really fun for me and hopefully for all of you because we've had some very colorful gentlemen here. Thank you to Chris Pang, Benedict Wong and Daniel Day Kim. Yeah.